Well, good morning, and welcome to Ocean City Baptist Church. We are glad that you have chosen to join us and to worship with us this morning. I uh, wanted to just remind you that we are praying for you. You are in our thoughts and prayers each day, and uh, we are glad to have you together with us this morning. As always, we, wel- we uh, want to wish uh, a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. We're glad that you've joined us and hope that um, you enjoy the worship and uh, the preaching of God's Word that is to come. Just one announcement for you this morning, and uh, that is that we have a Tuesday night Zoom meeting with uh, our missionaries, uh, with Missionary Flights International. Uh, Most of you have gotten an email about that. If you have not, uh, make sure that you uh, let the church office know, email the church office, and we can put you on that list. Uh, But we're going to be uh, getting together 7 p.m. Tuesday night with Drew and Betty Ungst, hearing an update about how their new ministry is going with um, that uh, work that is in both South Florida as well as Haiti and the Bahamas. Uh, So we hope that you'll join us for that. That again starts at 7 o'clock. As I mentioned in my email, we are going to Uh, fire up the Zoom cameras at 6.30 for anybody who would like to get together for a little bit of virtual fellowship for the half hour beforehand. And uh, I know many of you are missing seeing each other, so if you'd like to get on, know that I'll be on there at 6.30. We can enjoy some time of fellowship, and then Drew and Betty will join us at 7 p.m. Again, that's Tuesday night, and please email the church if you have any questions about it. With that, I'm going to ask Pastor Jamie, if he would, to come and to begin this morning's service with the reading of God's Word and a pastoral prayer. Good morning. Please turn to your copy of God's Word with me to Psalm chapter 42. Psalm chapter 42. Psalm chapter 42. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember from the land of Jordan and of Hermon From Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all the breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy? As with deadly wounds in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your unfailing love and your mercy that you show us each and every day. We need your grace each day, and without it, we are without hope. Thank you for sending your sinless son to pay for our sin, which we committed against you. Thank you for calling us and drawing us, for redeeming us, sanctifying us, delivering our souls from death so that we can spend eternity worshiping you. You have given us so many things, We don't have words to express our thankfulness for the undeserved salvation that you have given to us. You've also given us the fellowship of the saints in this church body. You've given us copies of your word that we can read on our own, um, in our own language, and, um, and meditate on. You've given us the freedom to worship 
the provisions of shelter and food and clothing, and you've been so kind and gracious to us all. Help us to hate our sin as we consider the cost of our sin that was placed on Christ. Deliver us from the many temptations of this world. Give us strength to mortify the deeds of our flesh and to walk in holiness. Forgive us of our daily sins against you. We want to walk in the light, being conformed to the image of your Son. We know that you sustain all things by the word of your power, including our life, and we thank you for the gift of life. We desire to worship you with our lives as a living sacrifice. We are grateful for the privilege to live as ambassadors of the gospel. This morning, we come with hearts that are eager to give you praise. Help us to rightly understand and apply your word through the help of the Holy Spirit. Our souls pant for you, our God, as a deer pants for water. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, wherever you may be this morning. Let's join our voices together and worship our worthy God.
Hallelujah. 
Well, this morning, we're going to head once again back to the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, you can uh, take them, turn there with me if you would. And as we head back to the book of Philippians, this time we're going to head not to Philippians chapter 4, where we've spent uh, the past month, but this time back to Philippians chapter 1. So turn back to Philippians chapter 1. Now, I had hoped and expected that we would be back together by the time I got through Philippians 4, 6 through 12. And that's where we've been the last four Sundays or so. But to my surprise, and your surprise, I'm sure, as well, here we are, still stuck in our houses each day, uh, including each Sunday, at least for the time being. But as I considered what to do next, uh, and as I considered where to go next in the Scriptures, I kept getting drawn back to this wonderful little letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And I think it's because this has so much to say to us during this pandemic. There's so much in this letter that is relevant to our current situation. And so I want to take however much longer we have apart uh, to do a brief survey, and again, I say that by faith, hopefully a brief survey, through this very encouraging book. So what I'd like to do is to get an overview of how this book starts out by reading Philippians chapter 1. Uh, if you would, follow along as I read. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers of me uh, with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and, co and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really, ha has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. But it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, 
engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. If you would, bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we examine this portion of Scripture, Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment, Lord. I pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, to the truths that it contains for us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply them rightly to our lives this morning. Give us your grace through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What we see in the opening chapter of Philippians is that we share something in common right now with Paul and the church at Philippi, and that is we're facing hard times. You can hear the language of difficulty and hardship woven through Paul's opening words here, can't you? It speaks of Paul's imprisonment in verses 7 and 13 and 14, antagonizing people who were trying to discourage Paul in verses 15 through 18, the possibility of his death in verse 20, people opposing the Philippian church in verse 28, the suffering that the church was going through in verse 29, and conflict in verse 30. This is a letter for difficult times, which is why I think that there's so much that's applicable to us today. Now, the other thing that I find so relatable to our situation, and I think especially in chapter 1, is Paul's love for his brothers and sisters in Christ from a distance. You can hear his love and his longing for the Philippian believers in his writing, but it's a longing from a distance. Paul was such a great example to us of craving fellowship with his fellow Christians, and indeed, a a model for having fellowship at a distance as well. I read an insightful piece about it this week. It says this, For an example of real fellowship, we look to the Apostle Paul, who models the right orientation for both close and far away interactions. Paul did most lasting and well-known ministry by distance. We read the names of specific friends and co-laborers because he cared deeply enough to write letters, sometimes even to people he had never met and never would this side of heaven. Paul has this delightful way of passionately holding on to two extremes simultaneously. He speaks often and with obvious depth of feeling of how much he longs to be with them again. And yet, he also clearly feels a deep sense of connection with the churches simply by writing, praying for them, being involved in their affairs from afar, and by hearing good news of their deepening faith and love. There's no question that Paul's deepest desire was to be with his believing brothers and sisters in person. And indeed, we, along with him, look forward to a day when there will be no more geographic separation, and those we've loved in Christ will be our joy and our crown in his presence. But Paul does not hesitate to seize the technology available to him, handwritten and hand-delivered letters, to press forward his love, concern, and deep affection for those with whom he is united in Christ. No doubt he'd have posted words of encouragement, prayer, and concerned warning on the Facebook page of the churches if such options had been open to him from his cell in Rome. And so the question to us, then, is simple. Will a season of enforced remote work and online fellowship lead us to become people who spiral down into disconnection and increasing self-focus? Or will it spur us to long to be with others in every way we can and do much more than small talk, however we connect? Will we use text and video now to foster fellowship we might otherwise have ignored or been too busy to invest in? Will we, in short, follow Paul's example of loving others in such a way that we grab any chance we have to know their hearts, encourage them in Christ, and receive their encouragement in return? If we do, Our relationships now will deepen despite COVID-19 and the prospect of a post-pandemic world, which will likely rely all the more heavily on technology, will be less threatening. It is an unfathomable privilege to know that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and those who would be like him. Let's aim to check our hearts and let nothing, neither distance nor technology, nor busyness, nor small talk, separate us from loving each other well. What a great quote. Paul, like us, longed to be with his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. As uh, Beth and I and the kids have uh, driven around uh, this past 
three to four weeks or so, that's what we've been hearing from those of you that we've been able to see. And now, of course, we've kept our uh, visitations from the van to the front porch to keep our social distancing. And I realize we haven't been able to get to all of you, so uh, thank you for your patience if we haven't gotten there yet. But for almost all of those that we have been able to visit, we've heard a common refrain. Thank you for the messages. Thank you for the service online. But you know, we can't wait to be back together again. We can't wait to be uh, fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's just not the same. This is the same thing that Paul was saying. Of course, except that his social distancing was because of a prison and not because of a pandemic. But because of the parallels that we see here, we're going to get a glimpse from our passage today at how we can be a good church during a time of mandated separation, mandated social distancing. I'll bet you've never thought that the Bible would address a topic like social distancing, did you? But it's true. We're going to see some examples from Paul himself, and then we'll also see some from his encouragement to the Philippian church as well. All of them are going to be traits that we need to have as Christians during this difficult time. So this morning, let's take a look at four ways we can approach social distancing in a biblical way. Our text this morning is Philippians 1, verses 3 through 8. Let's look at it one more time. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. The first thing that we see in this passage is that during this separation, we need to have a passionate and a persistent prayer life. We need to have a passionate and a persistent prayer life. Paul models here a passionate and persistent prayer life for us as he is separated from the believers at Philippi. He begins by saying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Did you pick up the repetition there? Did you see the theme? Paul constantly had in mind and in prayer all of his brothers and sisters from the Philippian church. It shows that he thought about them and then prayed for them often. He was continuously praying for these saints each time he approached God in prayer. His prayer for them was always joyful, he says, and and he included them, each of them, at the time of his prayer. Here was a man who was what we might call in isolation. He was a man who was in forced quarantine, but who had a serious prayer life for others. This was a man who easily could have become self-focused. Think about it. He was sitting in a prison, awaiting trial, stuck in Rome, chained to a guard, suffering for the gospel. His conditions were truly miserable. We think of our conditions right now as being miserable, right? We get uh, tempted towards self-pity Uh, If we can't go to the beach or go out uh, to a restaurant or to a movie for a few months. But Paul was literally chained to a prison guard in a dark prison with no end in sight. You might feel like your house walls are closing in on you. Like uh, perhaps uh, they're uh, feeling a bit like a prison. (laughs) But, but, But Paul was literally in a prison... And I guarantee you, your house compares nothing to what he was facing. And yet, rather than wallowing in self-pity, Paul chose to joyfully give thanks to God and to spend his time praying for others, lifting his churches up, his brothers and sisters in Christ before the Lord. Most of us have much to learn 
from Paul's prayer life. How many of us have turned inward as times have gotten tough? How many of us have wallowed in the poor me's and have been tempted to just pray for ourselves and our own families during this time? How many of us have been tempted to look at ourselves and what we're in and just turn our gaze upon ourselves? Paul's example here is that we should always be focusing our prayers on others and not merely on ourselves, no matter how dark the circumstances. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with praying for others. We certainly need to be petitioning the Lord for our needs. But there's much to be said for the proper perspective that we gain when we selflessly pray for others during a time of difficulty. Now, the question is, how was it that Paul got to this point? How was it that he got this way? What made him have such a passionate, persistent, and others centered prayer life. Well, it came from the second lesson that we need to learn from this passage, and that's that we need to have a passion for God's people during this time. We need to have a passion for God's people during this time. Paul's dedicated prayer life, his constant prayer for the Philippians, it didn't come out of a vacuum. It flowed out of a genuine love for these people. What you need to realize is that you cannot manufacture persistent, fervent prayer for someone out of nothing. There has to be real love that's behind it and that drives it, or otherwise it's just not going to last. If you have merely a superficial and artificial sort of concern for someone... You might pray for them for a little while. You might remember them now and then, but it's soon going to become evident that your concern is only surface because it's never going to drive you to your knees in consistent prayer for that person. That has to come out of a genuine love and passion for that person. This is a good test for us to see if we have this kind of a concern for others. What's our level of love and concern for people who are part of our body of Christ? Are you praying consistently for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you dedicated to upholding people in prayer on a regular basis, especially during this time? Paul had a genuine passion for God's people, and it showed not just through his words, but through his prayer life, both here and throughout the rest of his New Testament epistles. You read where he prayed for his people, and you can see every time that it flowed out of a spring that was a heart full of people. He loved his people, and he was genuinely concerned for them. We see his love for the Philippian believers, again, not only through his prayers, but also in his writing. We see it in the words here that reveal his heart. He has that beautiful statement in verse 7 where he tells the Philippians, I hold you in my heart. This is endearing language, and it really shows how much he cared for them. It was something that went beyond sentimental feelings. It moved beyond mere emotions. This was true care and true concern for the people of God. This was deep love for a church that he demonstrated both in his words and in his actions, in the way that he prayed for them over and over and over again. He goes on in verse 8 to say, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. His love for the churches that he ministered to was deep. And again, it's not something that he manufactured. It's not something that he came up with from within himself. But it says here that he had the affection of Jesus Christ. When when he had this spring of concern, it sprung forward not simply from his heart, but from a heart that had Christ living within it. What What he's saying here is that it was actually Christ who was loving the Philippians through Paul. He was an instrument that was showing Christ's love for them. He was merely the one demonstrating the love of Christ to his brothers and sisters at Philippi. 
One commentator writes, here in verse 8, Christ is seen to be the source of the love that embraces and lays claim to the apostles' whole personality. Christ loves the Philippians in and through Paul. It is not Paul who lives within Paul, but Jesus Christ, which is why Paul is not moved by his own nature, but by the nature of Jesus Christ. The question is, can that be said of us? Can we say that we have an affection for each other and that the kind of affection that we have for each other springs forth from the affections of Jesus Christ within our hearts? That, that, that this kind of love is a supernatural love that springs forth from Christ dwelling and abiding within our hearts. Do others look at us and see Jesus' love radiating towards them from us? Because Jesus' love was real. It was tangible. It was sacrificial. It showed that it had substance, no more so than when it drove Jesus to the cross to die on the cross for our salvation and for our forgiveness of sins. When others look at you, do they see a real, tangible, sacrificing, Christ-like love? Something that actually springs from within you and drives you towards a sacrificial action like it did for Paul and ultimately like Christ. Do people see an example of what we call gospel love? We need to have such a love for others during this time that people can see not just worldly love, not just a man-made affection for one another, but rather Jesus' love springing up from within us and that kind of love radiating in tangible ways for others. Notice something else with me. There was another thing that was fueling Paul's passion for these people, and that is the nature of the church at Philippi. And here's where we turn from learning lessons from the life of the apostle to learning lessons from the church at Philippi. But before we begin begin looking at these lessons, we do need to understand one thing, and that is that Paul was writing to believers in this city. This was a church of believers Because ultimately, that's what a church is, an assembly of followers of Jesus Christ. And so when Paul addresses the letter in verse 1, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Saints are not some super spiritual people in some special class that only a few Christians will attain to, but rather, the word saints here means holy ones. It is written to the holy ones, that is, God's children who are in Christ Jesus. This is a foundational truth to realize if you are going to understand this book of Philippians. Because the joy that Paul talks about in Philippians, and that we're going to see as a thread running throughout this book, it isn't available to everyone. This book is not written to show the world how to be happy. It isn't meant to instruct the general public about seven tips to contentment. This is not going to help just anyone triumph over their circumstances. If Paul wasn't writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus, like he says in verse 1, then he wouldn't be able to say in verse 5, I thank my God because of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And so you need to understand that these words written by Paul are written to those who have repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus Christ for their salvation. If you've never done so before, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. That is, do not put it off until tomorrow because you don't know what a day will bring forth. Don't wait till later. Don't put things off. Stop right now. Get on your knees and ask God to save you by His grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Put your faith all in Him. For your salvation, so that he might save you from your sins, both the power of your sins and the consequences of your sins. If you are going to do that today, it's my hope that you'll reach out this week and let me know that you have. Nothing would make me happier than to hear that, and nothing would give me more joy than to point you in the right direction for some next steps. 
Our next steps, however, are to see what lessons we can learn from the Christians at Philippi about living in mandated social distancing. And so, the third thing that we see today is this. During this quarantine, we need to show the world our Savior through our participation in the gospel. During this quarantine, we need to show the world our Savior through our participation in the gospel. Listen, if you have truly trusted Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of His, then you've had your life transformed. If you're a Christian, then you want others to have that same experience also, right? You want to share the joy that you have in Jesus Christ with others. We, we want to see God's kingdom expand. We want to see His work accomplished. And we want to see His truth spread all over the world. And, and so if we are believers, and if that is true, then we should be eager to partake in the ministering of the gospel and in ministering to others. Look again at verses 5 through 7. He says, I thank my God because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. The Philippians had demonstrated the genuineness of their faith by ministering to others and by ministering to Paul in his difficulties. These were people who cared about the spread of the gospel. These were people who supported Paul in his imprisonment. They sent money to him when he needed it. They, they even sent one of their own to encourage him and to minister to him. They sustained him as he defended the faith both in his ministry as well as now in prison. The Philippian believers didn't become Christians by participating in the gospel or by ministering to Paul, but they showed some of the marks of a Christian when they did so. They exhibited through their participation in the cause of the gospel what a Christian looks like and what he or she truly cares about, what's truly in their heart. The question is, does your life show that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ? If Paul wrote a letter to you, would he start it out by saying, to a fellow saint in Christ Jesus? Does your life bear the marks of a genuine Christian through your passion for and your participation in the cause of the gospel? Are you doing what you can during this time to share the gospel with others and to support those who do? If so, there's one more lesson for you. Fourth, we need to remember that in spite of this difficult time, Christ will see us through. Christ will see us through. Verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What an amazing promise. Paul had confidence that God would absolutely accomplish what he had started in believers' lives in spite of of the difficulties, in spite of the hardships, in spite of the suffering. The good work that he refers to in this verse is God's work of salvation in our lives. He's saying that God will be faithful to bring it to fruition because He was the one who began it. God is the one who is doing it all along. If you're saved, then you were saved by God. You are being saved by God, and someday... In the last day, you will be saved by God. Eternal security is promised to all who have truly been saved by Him. God will never let us go, no matter how dark things look. And although we may sometimes fail God, God will never fail us. Although we may sometimes be unfaithful to Him, He will never be unfaithful to us. His faithfulness is new every morning. He doesn't say, well, if you don't make any mistakes, then God will keep you until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm sure of this. 
if you don't commit this particular list of sins, then I'm sure that God will keep you until the day of Jesus Christ. No, he says, I am sure of this. God will bring to completion His work in you. Why? Because it's Him who is doing it. One author writes this. Is there anyone among you who truly thinks their salvation hangs suspended on the thin thread of your own self-power and your commitment to righteousness? I know my own soul all too well. Were it not for God's persevering grace, I would have lost my salvation the day after I was born again. If ever it should come to pass, that sheep of Christ might fall away, my fickle, feeble soul, alas, would fall a thousand times a day. If you do not believe in the security of your soul in Christ, tomorrow should hold little but fear and misery and perhaps despair for you. For it may well be the day that you commit that sin that will forever sever you from the Savior's love. But I can face tomorrow and the day after and the day after that with confidence because I know that He will never leave me nor forsake me. We can face tomorrow because we are sure of this, that He who began a good work in us will bring it to to completion, will perfect it within us until the day of Jesus Christ. And so we can go, as Christians, beyond merely surviving this pandemic. As Christians, we should be able to thrive during this time of quarantine. But to do so, we'll we'll need to have a passionate and persistent prayer life, remembering to lift others up before the Lord. We'll need to have a passion for God's people that's deep down within us, holding our brothers and sisters in Christ in our hearts during this time that we're away and and drawing from the affection of Christ as He resides within us. We'll need to show the world our Savior through our participation in the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of His salvation to sinners like us. And we'll need to remember that in spite of this difficult time, Christ will see us through to heaven because He has promised us eternal life. And so I would encourage you, let's make sure this week that in spite of our quarantine, in spite of our social distancing, that we are loving God and we are loving others and that we're doing so in tangible ways. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for these words that we have at the beginning of Philippians, Lord, that encourage us, Lord, to live in a, uh, a distanced way, Lord, yet with a love for you and a love for each other. Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, first and foremost, for those who may be watching or listening today, Lord, who don't know you as their Savior. God, I pray that you would just reach down today and save them, Lord. Drop them to their knees, Lord, that they might cry out to you for the forgiveness of their sins that they might be born again through the power of the Holy Spirit and might come to have a personal relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that for those of us who are true believers, Lord, and followers of you, that, Lord, we would use this time, Lord, to, Lord, not simply survive, Lord, but to thrive spiritually in you. Lord, I pray that you would use this, this time of quietness and and being away from distractions, Lord, to deepen our prayer life. And that, Lord, we would, Lord, have a deepened prayer life, not merely for ourselves, Lord, but that we would, uh, Lord, grow in our prayers for others. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would grow in our passion for others, Lord, that that we would uh, truly, Lord, have the love of Christ for them and, and demonstrate that in tangible ways to others. Lord, I pray that we would also show our love, Lord, for this world, for those, for those who don't know you yet, Lord, in sharing in the participation of the gospel, Lord, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, using every opportunity that we have, Lord, to make people think of spiritual things and eternal things, even as we've had the things of this world stripped away from us and our minds for this short time. And finally, Lord, we want to give you praise and glory, Lord, that you have promised through it all, Lord, that you will hold on to us, Lord, that you will never let us go, but Lord, that you will guide us through it all 
and that you will carry us to heaven. Lord, we thank you that this all comes, not because of our work, Lord, knowing that we could fail so easily, but that it comes because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. This song is a triumphant song of walking by faith, but remember as we sing, it's till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Shall prevail.